Greetings. It is a great pleasure and an honor to be asked to participate in this incredible worldwide initiative of the Venus Lymphatic World International Network Foundation. The number of people that this reaches and the good that this does for uh, folks all over the world cannot be underestimated. And I'm so happy to be asked to be a part of this. And my hats off and congratulations to Sergio Giacini for uh, putting together this wonderful program and for all of us who are able to participate around the world. Now today, we're going to talk about something that's very important and that is we're going to talk about how to prevent the number one preventable cause of death after surgery and one of the leading causes of death from around the world. Remember, and we, we all have to understand this, of course, we're all created equal, but some of us are more equal than others when it comes to risk assessment. And we all have differences. And I'd like to point out that trying to give the same prophylaxis and put everybody in the same shoe as, as like this is, is, is uh, not possible. Everyone doesn't fit into this shoe. We all have different characteristics. We call them, uh, I tend to call this baggage, uh, heart, heart disease, cancer, uh, genetic factors, genetic predispositions, history of DVT. So we're all different. So we have to figure out these differences between all of us in order to apply and target the prophylaxis where it's most needed and not just give it to everyone, which is expensive, it causes complications, and it doesn't help. Patients with low risk scores, for example, in the Caprini risk assessment schema have been shown not to be helped with anticoagulant prophylaxis. You can't further lower an already lower incidence of thrombosis. This is not easy, but this is worth the effort. Collecting all of these data is really important in order to get the best picture of risk assessment for the patient. If you go to a doctor or a surgeon uh, and you're going to have a procedure, would you want the surgeon to just check over a few of the highlights and high points about you and your background? Or would you want that surgeon to very thoroughly look at everything that could possibly influence or cause a, 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 a venous thrombosis and thus either change the informed consent procedure or in cases of quality of life procedures, maybe you don't wanna have it because it's too risky based on your individual risk assessment. Now, although this is popular around the world, the good news is that this risk factor is comprehensive, the Caprini score. And it also tracks the very important incidents of family history and also of obstetrical misadventures, which could unmask the antiphospholipid syndrome. Now, the bad news is it's hard to collect all this data. So uh, some very bright people have come up with some innovative techniques uh, to help with this. Number one, employ the patient involve the patient in their health care. Patients love to be involved in their health care. We'll have them take the risk assessment and we'll discuss this. Now, finally, we've learned a lot over the years about how to prevent blood clots. And along comes this horrible pandemic, COVID-19, that introduces a whole new level of complexity to this process. And as a result of that, this increases a person's chance of thrombosis. Everybody understands that COVID-19 is associated with thrombosis in many, in many instances, and it's laced with thrombotic tendencies. So to assume that the risks are not high is not appropriate. The risks are just as high as the equivalent patient with the equivalent baggage before the COVID, and then it increases after the COVID. So that's very important to keep in mind. And you can't ignore history, but also remember we have to use common sense. It's fine to look at data, but it also is important to look at common sense. And if you pursue a course of action in the patient and the patient doesn't do well, and you've, well, I followed the guidelines, perhaps you wanna modify your approach in the future in order to produce a better outcome. So that having been said, Let's get on with a description of what I think is really important, and that is how to understand what each of these risk factors means. 
how to interpret it. I'm giving you my own personal interpretation of these risk factors. It may be subject to change, improvement, or analysis by others. I welcome all uh, constructive critical remarks because this is about making the whole process better. And why? What's the bottom line? What's the 10 ton elephant? Improving venous thromboembolism prophylaxis around the world in order to prevent deaths. So folks, let's get on with the show. I'd like to reemphasize how what a great pleasure it is to be a part of this wonderful international process, because this is what brings all of us folks together from around the world and is really absolutely vital in lowering the incidence of this fatal disease. We know that fatal pulmonary emboli are the number one preventable cause of death in hospitalized and surgical patients. Appropriate anticoagulant prophylaxis can prevent most deaths. Risk scoring identifies who is at risk for these emboli and guides the physician choices for preventive measures. Providing prophylaxis for the entire period of risk is the key to preventing these deaths not just during hospitalization, but as long as the patient remains at risk. Very important principle that's often overlooked and belies common sense. Now, going back to the origins of the, where I got the first idea about the Caprini score comes to my association with this wonderful surgeon Dr. Maxwell Burrow, Chief of Surgery and Vascular Surgery at the Somerset Medical Center in, in uh, New Jersey, and he was affiliated with Seton Hall University. And in 1981, he conducted several important studies using venography as an endpoint, so we know his results are accurate. And he showed that risk factors aren't all the same. As the length of surgery goes up, the incidence of venous thrombosis goes up. As the age of the patient goes up, the chance of a clot rises dramatically. But the blockbuster result from his data in 1981, which has never been overturned and many times affirmed, is that in his study, 66% of patients with a history of venous thrombosis suffered a recurrent thrombosis postoperatively. Very, very important data. So we cannot ignore a previous history of thrombosis in the patient regardless of how that thrombosis occurred. So let's talk about the Caprini score. The reason that I am very high on the Caprini score is for several reasons. First of all, it's, it's the most comprehensive validated risk assessment with over 40 factors. Secondly, it also tracks the very important family history and also obstetrical complications that may be uh, may unmask a hidden antiphospholipid syndrome, which could be a very powerful risk assessor for thrombosis. So what about the Caprini score? We know as the number of risk factors goes up, Anderson taught us many years ago, that the incidence of thrombosis goes up. We also know that risk factors have different power. Bed rest uh, and hormones are a low risk factor for thrombosis, but cancer, particularly pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, are very high risk factors for thrombosis. So th these powers have to be put into the equation. Combining the number of risk factors and analyzing the power of each risk factor, one comes up with a score. And this score is a very similar, simple, non-linear increase in the incidence of venous thrombosis related to the score. So as the score goes up, the incidence of clinically relevant events goes up. Here we can see that in the first validated study that, that was of significance from the University of Michigan in general surgical patients. And you can see the incidence is rather low, but once you get over eight, it skyrockets. So it's very, very important to, to, uh, to remember this algorithm. As I've said before in the introduction, everybody has unique risk factors that make them prone to developing a thrombosis. You can't put everybody in the same shoe. Obesity, cardiac or pulmonary disease, cancer, family history of blood clots or stroke, diabetes or hormone therapy are classic examples of that baggage which have to be evaluated for each and every patient. 
A risk score can be calculated based on these risk factors that is predictive of a thrombotic event if surgery, injury, or illness occurs. Knowing one's baseline score is an important part of their baseline medical record. Informing healthcare providers with this personal information is critical, especially if one contracts the coronavirus, experiences a dis disabling stroke, or requires emergency surgery, and you come into the hospital and you can't talk. Well, then if this score is already known, it can be analyzed by, by the admitting uh, team. Stop the music, everyone, right here. I would urge all of you that are listening to this to once it's over, to go get the form, fill the form out with your family and friends, take it to your doctor and get a score in your medical record. So if any of these events happen, you're prepared. Since capturing all the elements is a time consuming pro process, we prefer to use the patient fr friendly version that's been validated around the world. The family physician should be consulted after you come up with a score to make sure that the family physician who also knows your history, that he or she can, can calculate a final score, keeping them in a safe place, as I said. And if you have uh, an admission to the hospital with a coma or stroke and you can't talk, that's already there. And if, if you come in with COVID and you're very ill and people are rushing around trying to save your life, nobody's going to conduct a 40 question analysis, including what happened to your grandmother and your father and your aunt and so forth. That's not the time. Now is the time. So get busy doing your risk assessment. As a quote from a movie from Shawshank Redemption, get busy living or get busy taking the chance of dying in this case uh, by not having that risk assessment available. Just to reiterate these points, it's very, very important that not only do you have this score, but uh, rescoring the patients needs to occur when the patients develop these illnesses. So for example, you have a score in your family medical record. Now you get the coronavirus. Well, that score may have to be updated and we'll talk about that more later, or you're injured in an auto accident. Then of course that score has to be updated. This patient-friendly version has been produced by a number of, uh, and refined by a number of, of very brilliant people from around the world, all nationalities, all, all races and cultures. It's, it's a wonderful thing to have us, us all getting together in pursuit of a common goal, eliminating fatal pulmonary emboli. And here is the risk assessment. It's in patient-friendly terms. And I would like to point out in particular for women, especially those that have had a history of an unexplained stillborn infant, three or more spontaneous abortions, uh, premature delivery with, with a uh, growth restricted infant and toxemia. These may signal a very powerful uh, risk factor that some people carry in their blood called the antiphospholipid syndrome. We'll talk more about that later. The second really important part of this score is making sure that you talk about family history of thrombosis. Many screening tools and many uh, forms when you come in to fill out before your doctor don't even have this family history in, or if they do only count the first degree relative. We'll talk more about that later. And remember, the score needs to be revised during hospitalization, particularly uh, for pa patients, if they have reoperation, infection, central lines, cancer diagnosed during surgery. So that's very important. So remember that the updated score will often result in a change of thrombosis prophylaxis, including the advisability of post discharge prophylaxis. This is a dynamic instrument. I saw a case recently where the patient was scored very low on admission to have a simple surgical procedure, but then during hospitalization developed pneumonia, had to be reoperated due to a leak, had to get a central line, the wound fell apart, to, and, and then the patient had to have systemic antibiotics for this severe infection and then died. And they said, oh, we don't have to, the, we don't understand this because the initial Caprini score was low. Folks, get with the program. This is a dynamic incident, instrument and has to be updated as you go through your hospitalization. Now, 
I really feel that the definition of individual risk factors based on available literature are critical to obtain the most accurate assessment of patient risk. And remember, what I'm going to say from now on is a fluid document. This is subject to change. New literature is coming out every day, and we have to adapt to that. We've known for a long time that as a patient uh, who are very young have a low chance of thrombosis, but older patients have to have a very high chance of thrombosis. And for that reason, we score patients accordingly. And remember, this is what Professor Boro did in 1981. This is not rocket science. This is not new. And remember, those that don't understand history are, uh, have to repeat it. And just to point it all off as insignificant is very inappropriate, especially in this case with Dr. Boro, because he had venographic data. When we talk about varicose veins, we mean visible bulging veins, not just little spider veins. Swollen leg or legs is very important, and it has to be elicited with pretibial pressure as seen below. Loss of definition of the bony promises, prominences around the ankle is another sign. Obscured foot veins is yet another sign, and also an indentation of the leg when the stocking is removed. These are the characteristics that have to be looked for. These are the people that are finalizing the history and physical for a patient. They must conduct these examinations in order to provide an accurate assessment. Now, many medical diseases are increased risk for thrombosis, especially inflammatory bowel disease consisting of ulcerative colitis or regional ileitis. This includes active and inactive disease. We know since the original score was developed that active disease may be even a more powerful risk assessment factor, but we'll have to do what we're going to do uh, coming up in the future is to redefine some of these factors and then produce an updated score and validating it. Sepsis. We take a look at sepsis as an infection requiring IV antibiotics. Diverticulitis, if acute, cellulitis and abscess, bacterial infection of the bladder and the lungs, and of course, systemic infection. The criteria is if they're on IV antibiotics. Acute myocardial infarction. Uh, for one month. We now know that there's literature that the risk may be uh, increased for three to six months, but again, that's future. We'll take a look at that going down the line. Serious lung disease, pulmonary fibrosis, emphysema, COPD are a very important. Pneumonia, of course, but don't double count it. If they have pneumonia, then you can count it as infection or a medical disease, but not both. Abnormal pulmonary function and, of course, pulmonary hypertension. Congestive heart failure is a very, very important risk factor. And remember, the ejection fraction may be normal, it may be abnormal, but that's not the sole criteria for congestive heart failure. There are other criteria that are very important, including hypertrophy of the, uh, of the cardiac chambers, uh, valvular uh, abnormalities causing hypertensive uh, cardiomyopathy is also a problem. And again, you have these other associated uh, effects and often in these patients who have congestive failure because often they have congestive failure because of morbid obesity. They could have insulin dependent diabetes uh, and metabolic syndrome and so forth. Now the female risk factors, critical. Pregnancy, of course, premature birth with toxemia or growth restricted infant, multiple spontaneous abortions, a stillborn infant, uh, estrogen contraceptives, and hormonal replacement, including tamoxifen. You'll notice those that are marked with an asterisk, and that's because these clinical events may be a clue to an underlying antiphospholipid syndrome. So what, is it, what does that mean? Well, the antiphospholipid syndrome is a syndrome, uh, first of all, that requires one clinical and one laboratory criteria. The clinical criteria include arterial venous or small vessel thrombosis without vessel wall inflammation. But most importantly for this discussion, pregnancy, pregnancy, pregnancy morbidity, including premature births with toxemia, growth restricted infant, multiple spontaneous abortions, or a stillborn infant. The laboratory criteria are three, a lupus anticoagulant, an anticardiolipin antibody, or a beta-2 glycoprotein antibody. These are IgG, IgM antibodies. And if a person has one of those criteria, the risk of thrombosis is increased. If they have two, it's even further increased. And three, it's even further increased than that. What is the tip-off? 
the tip off is to, in a female patient is these obstetrical misadventures and the patient may carry these uh, laboratory criteria in their blood lifelong. So an older patient having a cancer operation, for example, who's a female, you've got to make sure you know their history in order to know whether or not you need to screen them for these defects. Again, I emphasize and I would encourage all of you young people to really learn your history. Now we go back to 1856 and Professor Virchow, who was a brilliant German pathologist, who came up with the reasons why people develop venous thrombosis. And he ascribed them to vessel wall injury, stasis, and changes in the blood, hypercoagulability. Nowhere is that more important than surgery. And the definition of a major surgery as a thrombosis risk factor is based on Virchow's triad postulates, as we're going to discuss, and they're also time dependent. They get worse as time goes on. First of all, the effects of anesthesia replicate Virchow's triad. The anesthetist that has to do a, a general anesthesia has to paralyze the, the, the patient. And the uh, venous stasis occurs due to, to uh, calf muscle paralysis. Professor Coolridge Smith, over 20 years ago, did some duplex scan studies before and after the patients got their muscle relaxation, their paralysis, and watched what happened to the veins. Well, without the muscular tone, the veins dilate. And as they dilate, they get over distended and the, there's cracks produced in their lining. Those cracks are vessel wall injury. So now that's the second feature. And then hypercoagulability is already there, secondary to the surgical stress. Maybe the patient comes in with cancer or COVID. And, and don't forget that the patient's muscles and tissues are metabolizing. So those metabolites are going into the venous circulation, hoping to be flushed out by adequate flow. And when they just sit there like a puddle, that creates hypercoagulability that in, encourages the risk of a thrombosis. The time of anesthesia intensifies these effects and it's important to use pneumatic compression to minimize these changes, although that doesn't reverse them. So in essence, what I'm telling you is the effects of anesthesia, either general or regional, have a, produce a perfect witch's brew for the encouragement of the development of venous thromboembolism. Here we see an experiment done by a brilliant vascular surgeon, uh, Tony Camerata, who showed us that when the veins get over distended, cracks form in the end of endothelium, and this leads to exposed collagen and then clots form in these cracks as seen in this photograph. This is a million power micrograph in an experimental situation of venous dilatation during surgery. Now here's an experiment. You can see this is a white cell that changes into an adhesion molecule as you can see the picture darkened because of stasis. And this adhesion molecule then rolls along the surface of the endothelium where it finally will come to rest. And when it comes to rest, an inflammatory response occurs and it, it, it extrudes granules. And these granules creating this inflammatory response produce a defect in the wall of the endothelium. And as a result of that, the endothelium no longer is capable of, uh, of, of, of being intact and then other molecules come along and then produce eventually an obstruction in that capillary. So that's a very important mechanism. And here is a electron photomicrograph of that mechanism. And here you see a, 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 one of these inflammatory uh, markers, the cells that have changed from a white cell into an adhesion molecule and it's about to uh, go through the wall of the endothelium. Now we score these patients, if they're having minor surgery less than 45 minutes, it's one point. Major surgery over 45 minutes, it's two points. And this open surgery it also counts for two points, as well as laparoscopic or arthroscopic surgery. Past major surgery, uh, we count as one point, and hip or knee replacement is five points. Remember several things about this, which are really critical. This is, first of all, based on the anesthesia time. Not if you have a simple operation 
that takes two hours, it's a minor surgery. Maybe minor surgery from the surgical standpoint, but not from the anesthetic standpoint, based on everything I've just presented in the previous slides. The other thing is that this is a work in progress. We now know there's, 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 we're nearing 200 articles using the scoring system around the world. And we're learning some things. It's not perfect. There are some flaws. And one of the flaws relates to this surgical analysis. First of all, we didn't include in the original assessment, and it was a mistake, that the length of surgery escalates the risk of thrombosis. Maxwell Boro taught us that. So that's one problem. The second problem is there are certain operative procedures that by their very nature are more likely to produce a thrombosis than others. One of those is abdominoplasty, where the abdominal cavity is, is, is shrinked. It, it's, it's constricted because you sew together the diastasis between the rectus muscles. And then uh, over top of that, uh, you put a binder and that increases the interabdominal pressure, which increases the pressure in the leg veins, slows down blood flow out of the legs, and by itself is an extra mechanism for thrombosis. So remember now, this is a living document, but for the time being, we're using the current definitions until we develop a, a new score. Bed rest is a well-known risk factor for thromboembolism. But what does that mean, bed rest? When I look back at a lot of these randomized studies, and these very beautiful, elegant statistical analysis, they count bed rest as somebody who can't get out of bed at all. And um, if they can get out of bed and go to the bathroom, they're not counted as bed rest. That's a mistake. History, 20 years ago, there was this famous Metanox trial. And during this Metanox trial, they evaluated and divided patients into whether or not they could walk 30 feet. Now, the Metanox trial, what was that? That was a large study done to show whether or not the low molecular weight heparin enoxaparin could statistically significantly reduce the incidence of venous thrombosis in medically ill patients during hospitalization. So in those days, of course, it wasn't the standard. So the standard practice was not to give that. So that was the control group. And then the equally divided was a treatment group that received low molecular weight heparin. Now, within each of those groups, the treated group and the control group, ambulation was evaluated. And this was later put together in a sub-analysis by another brilliant professor who I've had the honor to know, Al Peshamin. But this, this, this study showed that the rate of venous thromboembolism for patients who couldn't walk the 30 feet and who didn't get low molecular weight heparin was 19%, almost 20%. That was cut in half if they could walk 30 feet. So that was a 50% risk reduction. Now in the, in the patients that were treated with low molecular weight heparin, which of course was very successful, and there was only a 9% incidence of venous thrombosis in those patients if they couldn't ambulate, according to the definition. But if they could ambulate, there was a 66% risk reduction in the incidence of venous thromboembolism. The authors went on to point out, and this should be remembered by everyone, that once the patient is ambulatory, that only removes the risk factor of bed rest. It does nothing to remove or change the risk factors of cancer, previous history of thrombosis, inflammatory bowel disease, and all of the other baggage that the patient has. For people to say, if you'll just get up and walk around, we don't have to give you this painful shot is ridiculous because you have to look at all of the risk factors that are associated with a person developing thrombosis. Another thing that's very important and has been shown a long time ago, and we'll get back to at some point, is that the length of prophylaxis really should be at least a week in all the studies, but many patients go home sooner and that isn't being followed. Another story for another day. Now continues with these, uh, risk analysis. Remember, remember, as we said, that none of the other patients' risk factors, I'm being redundant here because I, I see this happen so often and people ignore this principle so often, is they don't look at all of the risk factors that a patient has. And remember that sitting up in a chair or walking short distance to the bathroom does not qualify as ambulation according to this definition. Now let's talk about immobility. 
This is another very important analysis and, and, a, and an important risk factor. Patients who are using a cane or walker for stability are not considered as having restricted mobility if they can use their calf muscles in both legs for ambulation and can walk 30 feet or more at one time. Now, the process of pumping blood out of the leg is dependent on the calf muscles pumping. And in order for them to pump, you've got to flex your ankle. Look down at your ankle and try, try flexing your muscles in your calf without flexing your ankle. And the other thing, it requires weight bearing. If you're not weight bearing, that doesn't activate the foot pump. So a person who has a cast boot or brace that inhibits the normal calf muscle action in one leg is still considered immobile and remains at increased risk. It doesn't make any difference how far they can walk with their crutches or walker if they're, if they're, if they're not able to use the calf muscle pump. Worse yet, if they're not weight bearing, there's no increase in blood flow as a result of, of, uh, of non-weight bearing legs. And this has been shown, the reference is sitting right there uh, with the Doppler. It's just like you're sitting in a chair. So you have no protection if you don't walk, on, put weight on that leg. Toe touch does not qualify. One more problem regarding this, and that is the popliteal entrapment syndrome. You're looking at a lateral view of a knee and the knee is slightly flexed and the Doppler probe is behind the knee and we look here, the little red here is the artery and this big open space is the vein. As the knee goes from being slightly flexed to full extension, what's happening is that that vein can be occluded in, in a certain percentage of patients as a result of the gastrocnemius muscle. And here we go. As the leg is straightened, the vein goes away. As the leg is bent slightly, it returns. Goes away when it's straight. And for that reason, any brace that keeps a knee in full extension may show blood, uh, slow blood flow out of the leg, increasing the chance of a DVT. And a slight flexion of the knee prevents this effect. We all know about this. Guards who are standing at attention are urged not to lock their knees because they could faint due to decreased venous flow from the legs. They're supposed to keep their legs in a slightly flexed position. Now let us get to some really powerful risk factors. Past history of venous thrombosis. A prior deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism is a major risk factor for recurrent thrombosis, including provoked and unprovoked events. That's, 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 that definition, which is now in much dispute, a person getting an event, for example, from birth control pills, which have a very low incidence, maybe two per thousand young women will get a clot from birth control pills. But why do those two get a clot? What's different about their blood? So that's important thing to remember. Thrombotic stroke, secondary to a paradoxical embolus. 25% of us have a, 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 a patent uh, foramen ovale, an opening between the left and the right atrium, but it's non-functional. But if a clot breaks off from the leg, it goes to the right atrium and dilates the right atrium, that, that hole, that, that defect can open up and allow part of the clot to escape to the left atrium. Then it goes down to the left ventricle. It's pumped out. To, this, to the brain or to anywhere in the body through the arterial system. Remember the DVT of both the upper and lower extremities qualify, thrombosis in unusual qual qu uh, locations qualify. Uh, remember that one of the reasons that people develop thrombosis in unusual locations is because of the anti antiphospholipid syndrome. Another one which is very, very rare, is it, it, a very rare uh, disorder involving uh, the inflammatory system and producing a thrombosis uh, and is uh, only occurs in about one in a million patients, but uh, is a very important thing to keep in the back of your mind, especially if people do not uh, uh, respond normally to anticoagulation. Superficial thrombosis is considered by some people, especially in the absence of varicosities. If a person doesn't have any varicose veins and develops a superficial venous thrombosis, that's a very powerful event. And remember what Boro taught us in, in uh, 
uh, in, in 1981. 66 of patients, percent of patients with a history of VTE suffered a recurrent thrombosis event postoperatively. Failure to account for a family history of venous thromboembolism, including known thrombophilia markers, is a potential flaw in the risk assessment process. Many people don't even ask that question. You think about it, if you, anybody that's had surgery, how many times have you really been asked about that ahead of time? And here is a study that's not, re, not received enough publicity in my mind. 2013, it's seven years old. This was 183,000 patients that were studied over a 25 year period in Scandinavia. And what they showed was an increased risk of venous thrombosis, not only among uh, first degree relatives, but also among second degree relatives, third degree relatives, and non-biologic spouses, and, uh, or people that, that uh, are living together. And the, the reason for the latter group, although that's a weak effect, is that patients that are living together often have common lifestyles. And often those lifestyles are not conducive to uh, uh, healthy living and produ produce a venous thrombosis. The value of a family history as a risk indicator for venous thrombosis cannot be overemphasized. It has been shown, and these data are over 10 years old, family VTE history may reflect a family genetic risk factor. Carriers, are, if they have a carrier, they are at increased risk of averse venous thrombosis, particularly when exposed to environmental triggers. Surgery, muscle ruptures, immobilization, plaster cast, extended bed rest, hospitalization, pregnancy, use of oral contraceptives or hormone therapy, the diagnosis of malignancy five years before or six months after the index date. And oh, by the way, let's throw in the COVID problem because that escalates all of the risk factors for thrombosis. And remember another thing, most patients who carry a genetic risk factor, we can't diagnose. We can only diagnose a few of these factors. And so the relative risk of a thrombosis increased with the number of risk factors identified as I've just discussed, but a combination of a genetic and acquired risk factors in, in certain patients can result in a 60 fold higher risk of thrombosis compared to a person with no known risk factors and a negative family history. This fact has also not got enough attention, but it's very important because what it does is it highlights risk assessment. Again, remember the shoe. You can't put everybody in the same boat. This study of course showed a positive family history increased the risk of venous thrombosis more than twofold, regardless of the risk factors precipitating thrombosis. So that's another side of the coin. It's not to be confused with people that have a lot of risk factors. We score these patients uh, with a current or past history of thrombosis with a score of three, including a personal or a history of thrombophilia or a family history of thrombophilia. But these are only a few factors. And now there's a lot of changes that have occurred. We've learned a lot more about these factors since this Caprini score was first put together in 2005. So an updated version, which comes in the future, we'll have a refining of some of these factors. So it's very important during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, to uh, score the patient using the patient-friendly form and verify the final score with your personal physician. Now, speaking of the coronavirus, and we'll talk more about this later, is there are many roads to Rome. So if you're using another scoring system, fine, use it. But for God's sake, review the patient's history. Do not, do not overlook that patient history of thrombosis. And adding these scores, we add a, a score of, of two for asymptomatic patients. Uh, we add another point for symptomatic patients. And we add a third, for, a, a, a third category if the patient has a positive D-dimer. The healthcare team should update uh, the, uh, the score during hospitalization and at discharge. We've developed some criteria for the, for the uh, uh, COVID-19 patients uh, from the American Venus Forum. And we also think that patients on admission uh, must uh, be scored according to their baggage. And we have to consider those patients that come in and they have a lot of baggage. Again, keep coming back, don't forget the shoe. Those patients need more than the normal prophylaxis. And until the randomized prospective trials say otherwise, 
we should use an increased uh, uh, amount of prophylaxis in these patients. Already some of the guidelines recommend that for a high BMI. But there are other things besides a high BMI, heart failure, positive D-dimer, uh, past history of, or family history of venous thrombosis. And then rescore the patient at discharge using the extended chemical prophylaxis scores for those that are over eight with a positive D-dimer, uh, limited ambulation, or history or past history of VTE. Back to history. 2008, my brilliant uh, fellow who I had the honor to work with, Juan Arcelis, uh, and Monreal, Ma Emmanuel Monreal, let's take a moment and acknowledge him. The Riete rat database worldwide is an incredibly powerful source of information of real world events in real patients. There's over 100,000 patients now in this analysis. And what they showed in 2008 was that three quarters of patients got their clots once they went home from the hospital and half of them after prophylaxis was discontinued. Well, what's happened since then? We know that patients with high scores receive extended prophylaxis. We know that at least one other big publication that's come out in 2017 uh, reiterating these, uh, these effects and lamenting the fact that patients were not treated after they went home from the hospitalization and many of the guidelines. And now under consideration is an updated Riete database, which is showing the same thing. It hopefully will soon be published. Oh. Now we add COVID-19. COVID-19 is laced with thrombotic events. So that further increases these events. Is there anybody that thinks that the incidence of thrombosis is gonna go down in, in these patients as a result of COVID-19? The few early studies that indicate a low incidence of, of, re, of recurrence uh, after a COVID illness and they recur when they go home, they subject from that same painful thing of putting everybody in the same shoe. They do not risk assess the patients well enough so they don't know who really is at risk. So finally, folks, concluding thoughts. Perform the thrombosis risk assessment using the patient-friendly version assisted by your loved ones. Share the results with your family doctor to verify your final baseline score. Save the results as a part of your medical record that other family members can assess. Remember, if you develop COVID-19 as an outpatient, anticoagulant prophylaxis may be appropriate. Ask your doctor about continuing this prophylaxis when you are discharged. And if they say no, may, maybe say, why not? Finally, never kill a friend, never treat a stranger. This is a tribute in a way to my dear friend from Maine who was an academic dentist who was suffering from a very serious illness but came up with this suggestion never kill a friend and never treat a stranger. And that was one time when we were walking and I was talking about my risk assessment. And he said, well, Joe, it's very simple. He said, I understand you have to perform a history and physical to give you a, enough knowledge about that patient so that it's as if they're your friend. And of course, you would never hurt a friend, but you would never ever treat a stranger. So folks, did your doctor ask all the questions? Inquire about that, be vigilant. And thank you very much for listening to this dissertation. I recommend that you give me any feedback, especially not praises, but a constructive criticism. And I have a venusdisease.com site. I have a YouTube site, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. So please reach out to me and I will be delighted to try to communicate to you because we're all in this together. What is this all about? It's preventing the number one preventable cause after death and the number one preventable cause after hospitalization and a leading cause of death around the world. Thank you very much. You have a great day and stay safe.